Hey, good evening, church. It's so good to see you. Won't you give yourself a round of applause because you made it to church tonight? You know you couldn't have been anywhere in the world tonight, but you decided to be in midweek service. So go, go ahead and give yourself another round of applause. Hey, it's cold outside, and you couldn't have been tucked away, and you're snuggly because a blanket isn't enough. And we need our snugglies with their fireplace on, but you made it at church. So go ahead and give yourself an actual real round of applause. Not because I'm telling you to, but that was sad. Go ahead and give yourself an actual round of applause. Come on, church. There you go. There you go. It's so good to see you tonight. Um, for those who are first timers here, uh, my name is Danny. I'm honored to be a pastor here at Hope Chapel. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a portion of scripture. And the reason why we do that every single week is because how many of you guys know it's important as believers for us to be edified the word of God. Uh, we find it important for us to be able to understand scripture and and we do that every single week. So therefore the word can get in us. And therefore, if when we go back into our our cubicles, our, our communities, our neighborhoods, uh, we could be uh, practicing uh, the beliefs that we believe God has, has stored for us. And so I'm going to be looking at a portion of scripture uh, this week, um, and it's going to be in the book of John. So I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles, if you have one, to the book of John, and we're going to be looking at just three short verses. Um, John chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Again, that's John chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. And when you're there, say, I'm there. And if you don't have a Bible, then it's all good. We got you covered. God still loves you. We're going to, put this, we're going to display the words on the screen for you, so therefore you can follow along. Hey, you might have a Bible, and you might have a different version than I am, than I have. Uh, my version is the English Standard Version. And so, but we all believe that it's God's word at the end of the day. How many of you guys can say amen to that? If you haven't already, high-five your neighbor. Tell them it's good to see you. They got this best seat in the house because they're sitting next to you. If you haven't already, go ahead and tell your neighbor you look good. <laughs> tell them you may not smell good, but at least you look good. <laughs> Come on, John chapter 12. I'm doing too much tonight, church. You guys are doing way too much. Let's go ahead and read verses 1, 2, and 3. We read the gospel in the name of the Father, Son, and of the... Holy Spirit. My Bible titles it like this. Mary anoints Jesus at Bethany. I may drop out, but you guys continue along. Amen? Verse 1 says this. For six days after the, after the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany. Passover is capitalized because it's a holiday that they celebrated. Again, verse 1, it says, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Verse 2, so they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Verse 3, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Let us read verse 1, 2, and 3 again. Verse 6 says, verse 1, sorry, says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Just notice what Martha does. Martha served, and Lazarus, who just, just came back from the dead, was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary took a pound of expensive ointment and made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus. Somebody say Coco Chanel perfume. <laughs> and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. We titled tonight's message, After Giving Thanks. Look at your neighbor, remind them of the sermon title in case they forgot already, After Giving Thanks. The reason why we titled that this message was because uh, the past two weeks we talked about what it's like to have an attitude of gratitude. And we talked about how 
Um, the truth is, when we can look back in hindsight and we can look at all the things God has done for us, um, there are, the reality is that sometimes God uh, sometimes deserves and hallelujah from our part. Uh, sometimes we owe God an amen for the doors that he's opened, and sometimes we've got to give him thanks for the doors that he's closed, for the people he's put in our life, and even sometimes for the people that he's taken away. And so we talked about what it's like. How do we practice? What are some practical steps we can take to practice a life that resembles and reflects an attitude of gratitude? However, the reality is that there are some people in life, um, there may be some of you here tonight, that sometimes giving thanks is hard to do, depending on what season we find ourselves in, uh, depending what trials and tribulations we may be going through. Uh, the, the reality about life is that life, wouldn't you agree with me, that life has an interesting way of throwing us curveballs. And sometimes giving things isn't just the hardest thing to do, but in reality, sometimes it's the last thing we want to do. The reason why I share that is because Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they found themselves coming out of a season which was probably the hardest season they've had a, a, ever experienced, which was their brother's death, which was Lazarus. However, in the next chapter, which is the chapter you and I, the three verses in the chapter we just read, they practice a live a lifestyle of living um, for God and practicing and resembling and reflecting what it's like to do what we ought to do after we give thanks. So that's what we're going to be talking about. At the end of the message, my, my point is, my, my goal is for us to be able to land at a place where we can be able to say, this is what I ought to do because I'm thankful. No matter how hard it is, this is what I'm going to do because I'm going to remain grateful. So look at your, look at your neighbor, remind them of the message again, and remind them of the sermon title, After Giving Thanks. Let us pray. About three of you participated. Thank you for those three. <laughs> Let us pray, God. We thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given us tonight. Thank you, God Almighty, that you allow us to have this space, God, that, that exists, that we can come and give you honor and give you praise. For all my brothers and sisters in this place tonight, I pray, Father, that you will speak to us in a profound way, God. I pray that you would meet us in a season that we're in, God. I pray, Father, that if anybody came into this place discouraged, I pray that tonight uh, you would help them find encouragement, God. If there's anybody in this place who is hopeless, I pray that tonight, God, they will leave filled with hope, God. And as we are in this place, God, I pray, Father, that you will allow us to be able to receive the word that you have in store for us, so much so that we can go back into our cars and however we came, God, and we can produce a huge harvest from the seed that has been planted in our hearts, minds, and souls, God. And as we're in this place, I, I pray for every family represented in this place tonight, God, and I just pray, Father, that you will continue to protect them, God, shelter them with your precious his blood, God, no matter where they're at, when their kids are at school, God, when their grandkids are at school, God, won't you protect them, God, when we're on our way to work, when we're at work, God, whatever we may be doing, won't you just protect us, Father, and right now, we just ask you, Father, for anybody that is sick, won't you heal them and make them whole, any loved one that's in the hospital, God, anybody experiencing um, a chronic illness, God, right now, we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you will be invited in their circumstance, and that you would make them well, Father, and you will allow these people to come out stronger than they came in, God. As Christians, we believe, Father, that there is no limit to the things that you're able to do. We believe, God Almighty, that you are able to do it all. And right now, we just proclaim and declare your promises over our loved one's life. And we proclaim and declare your promises over our life as well, God. And right now, while we're at it, we also ask you that chains will be broken tonight. In Jesus' name, any bondages, any strongholds, any addictions, God, any secrets that we may have behind the scenes, God, won't you just break those chains right now in Jesus' name and rebuke the devil over our lives, over our marriages, over our finances, God, over our, over our hearts, over our souls. And we ask you, Father, that you will permeate something so strong within our souls and our spirits that we have no choice but to give you thanks for everything we've endured, God. Thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for your mercy. And in Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And the church says, amen. the church says, amen, amen, and amen. How many of you guys are grateful for God? I'm grateful for God. I'm grateful for our community. Um, and I'm grateful that I can be able to come to a place where I can, uh, I can just confess some things. So there's some things I want to confess to you. Is that okay? I want you guys to pray for me because the reality about uh, just being a human being 
is that there are some people that uh, are hard to love. How many of you guys can agree with me? There are some people that it's just, it's not easy to get along with. There are some people, maybe if you've experienced them, uh, uh, maybe you've crossed paths with them. And as I go through a list of, 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 of people that I, we, I try to love, um, you might think of some people. You might think of your cousins. You got, everybody got that one cousin. But the reality is that there's some people that are hard to love because there's some people that are just mean. They're just simply mean. You can see it in their face. They're just mad. They're always mad about something, right? There's some people that just, they're not just mean, but they also sometimes don't have anything good to say. It's like everything's negative, and it's just like the more you engage in conversation, sometimes you kind of find yourself like you see them walking down the hallway, and you're like, okay, let me just turn around because I know if I engage in a conversation, and I'm going to hear 20, 30 minutes, minutes of negativity. But as, as hard as it is to love those people, that's exactly what they need is just someone to love them. It's hard to love people who are mean. It's hard to love people who sometimes have nothing nice to say. And it's even sometimes hard to love those people that always seem to have a bad attitude. Everything they can, can be going good in their life. They can win the, the lottery, for goodness sake, and they're still going to be mad about something. They could have won all this money, and they can say, man, I could have won more money. There's just something, always something negative coming out of them. Not, not only is it hard to love people who have um, uh, a bad attitude or some, not, don't have anything good to say, and, or, or sometimes it's hard to love for me. I don't know about you guys. Maybe this is just me. If it's just me, did y'all pray for me because I'm actually going through some things? But if it's just me, sometimes it's hard to love people who are cheap. You ever go out to eat with some friends and for some reason, they can't break up the bill, so every, there's only one tab, and that one friend, I want to act all of a sudden like they didn't order a, a, a cherry Coke, and so now you got to put in for the cherry Coke, but you know dang well everybody got water, but there's only one person from the group got cherry Coke. Sometimes it's hard to love people who are cheap. Come on, talk to me, church. Come talk to me. I, I, I know I'm not the only one. It's hard to love people sometimes, Amen. And it's also hard to love people while I'm at it. I'm going to go down the list while you think about your cousins. I, it's also hard to love people who have no sense of urgency. They walk slow. They drive slow. They talk slow. And it's just like, you may have nowhere to go, but I do. And so, Lord, help me love those people who have no sense of urgency. And the reality, church, is that I know as a practicing Christian, I'm, I'm called to love and I'm called to display the gospel of Jesus Christ and and, and, but the reality is that sometimes we come across people that are simply hard to love. And we take a little bit more time praying about those relationships and those people in our sphere um, because it, we want to love them. But the reality is that it's, it's challenging. Not only is it hard to love people who are cheap, it's hard to love people who have no sense of urgency. It's hard to love people that they're always mad about something. They always got something bad, to, negative to say. Uh, but, it's also, but it's also hard for me to love people who don't know how to say thank you. You could tell them, have a good day, and they just walk right by you. You open the door for you, they, for them, and they just walk right by you. You want to grab their arm and let's do this again. So they can come back and say, thank you. But what do we do after Thanksgiving? Because after Thanksgiving, we're, we're, we're prone to go around a table. We go around the sanctuary, and, and we're, we're prone and accustomed to name the things or the people or the situations we're, we're thankful for. But how do we go from thankful giving to thankful living? How do we practice a lifestyle and show God that we are thankful for everything he's got us through. When I think about the things God's got me through, when I think about how good God has been to me, I can't help but to say amen. I can't help but serve him. I can't help but put my hands together and just say, God, thank you for opening those doors. God, thank you for closing those doors. God, thank you for this person that you put in my life. And when I start to really think about everything God has done in my life, I can't help but to stay in that, and stay in that mindset for, for a few minutes and simply just give him honor and to give him praise. And some of us can testify about God's goodness. Some of us can testify how God's provided 
provided for us. Some of us can testify how he's opened doors. Some of us can testify how he's healed us. Some of us can testify how he's got us through the hardest parts of our life. And some of us can even testify because we have been recipients of his grace. We have been recipients of his mercy. We have been recipients of his unconditional agape love. And when you look back in hindsight, you can be able to say, God, if it wasn't for you, I have no idea where I would be right now. If it wasn't for you, God, I don't know where my marriage would be. If it wasn't for you, I don't know where my kids would be. If it wasn't for you, God, I don't know where my career would be. God, if it wasn't for you. And sometimes the reality is we owe God some amens. And we owe God some hallelujahs. Remember growing up at my parents' house or for Thanksgiving, the day after Thanksgiving, the Friday, um, I remember one day we one, one year I woke up and I realized that it was just me and my dad in the house. I have one older sister and I have my mom. And so I woke up and I noticed it was just me and my dad in the house and he was still asleep. So I want to go wake him up. And I said, Dad, what are we doing today? And he said, what do you mean what are we doing today? The ladies are out shopping and the men, we get to sleep in. And I said, what do you mean? Thanksgiving's already over? And then I, because Thanksgiving ought to be more than just one day. Thanksgiving ought to be more than just a Sunday shout. Thanksgiving ought to be more than just a praise on a Thanksgiving event. Thanksgiving ought to be a lifestyle that we live. The reason why I share that with you is because by the time we journey over to John chapter 12, the context of what's going on, Jesus is in the city of Bethany. In order for us to be able to understand the content, I'm going to provide us some context Jesus would occasionally stop at Bethany. The reason why he would stop at Bethany in this occasion is because he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way where, church? He's on his way to Jerusalem, and on his way there, he stops at a small city called Bethany. And the reason why he stops there is because scholars believe that his best friends lived there. And those best friends were Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Bethany was about two miles away from Jerusalem. And as he's traveling there, it's, we see in Scripture that he stopped at least three times at their house. First time we see him stop is in Luke chapter 10. And if you're familiar with Scripture and if you're familiar with the church experience, then it's the story where Martha is mad at her sister because Mary is simply at the feet of Jesus. And while she's trying to get everything in order, while she's trying to make sure everything's perfect for Jesus, she, she tells Jesus, hey, Jesus, won't you tell my sister something because she's not doing anything. And so Jesus responds and says she's actually doing the best Thing. That's the first time we see Jesus stop in the city of Bethany. The second time we see him stop in the city of Bethany is the chapter before John chapter 12, which is John chapter 11. The reason why he's there is because Mary and Martha sent for him because Lazarus at the time was sick. He ends up passing away. Jesus shows up. He makes a miracle in their life. That's the second time in scripture we see Jesus in the city of Bethany with his best friends. The third time we see Jesus in the city of Bethany is in the story we just read tonight, John chapter 12. In John chapter 11, Jesus is met by Mary and Martha with frustration because by the time Jesus shows up on the scene, her, their brother is already dead. But in John chapter 12, he's not met with frustration. As a matter of fact, he's met with enthusiasm. So as we journey from one chapter to another, you have to ask yourself, well, what happened? How does he go from being met from, from anger and frustration to enthusiasm and joy? Well, because he made a miracle in Lazarus' life. And so they're grateful that he showed up on the scene. And how many of you guys can be grateful that when you called upon Jesus, he showed up? How many of you guys are grateful when your back was up against the wall that we, can, that we serve a God that is accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week? And I'm all for us having friends, and I'm all for medical professionals, and I think we need them more than ever before. But there are some things that we can run to God to. If not, all, we can run to God for all things, and he's always going to listen. And that's what I love about Jesus Christ is that it doesn't matter where we're at. It doesn't matter what we're doing. It could, we could be in the shower. We could be in our Toyota to Corolla, and we can cry out to Jesus, you know what? He's always accessible, and that's one thing we ought to be grateful for. Amen. He shows up on the scene. And what I love about this is that he has a relationship with them, and they feel comfortable enough to invite Jesus into their home. And it makes me wonder, do we feel comfortable enough to invite Jesus, not into our homes, but into every situation? And I think when we do, then we see a different outcome. 
I think we start to see his way work in our life. And I do believe that when we start to invite Jesus into big decision making or into small decisions that we have to make, I do believe that he starts to steer us in the right direction. And the beautiful thing about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus and what they do is when they invite Jesus in, they do it because they're in relationship with him. And I would love to be a part of community of people who are in relationship with him and are constantly inviting him in in whatever they may be doing, projects, moving, or new, a career change, or a relationship that's coming, or a school that you want to apply at, whatever it may be. If we invite Jesus in, that I do believe we see the outcome that he wants for our life. He shows up on a scene because he's accessible. He shows up on the scene because he's in relation because he's in relationship with them. And he shows up on the scene. This is my favorite part because he simply cares. He cares. You call upon him and he shows up simply because he cares. And here's how they all individually show Jesus that they're grateful. The first thing that we see is that Martha, point number one, that this leads me to my first point. That if we're going to know what it's like to have a, a life of, of, of gratitude, if we know what, it, what we ought to do after we give things, the first thing that I want to share is that Martha serves with her talents. Martha is great. If any, if, if Martha, what, what she did is she was great at hospitality. That's her gifting. When you study scripture and when you study uh, her, her character, if, if, she, if, if there's anybody who knew how to throw a party, it was Martha. Martha was the type of person that when you went over her house and she threw a party, you wanted to go home with a centerpiece. You know what I'm talking about? Because she knew exactly what she was doing. Martha made everything perfect when it came to hospitality. That's her gifting. She was the type of person that when you went over her house and she had a carpet, you can see the carpet lines because of the vacuum. That's what Martha did. She is great at hospitality. And one thing I think the church ought to know is, is to acknowledge that you have a talent. That there is a gift that God has bestowed upon you. That God has given you and entrusted you with a gift. And in order for us to be able to show Jesus that we're thankful for everything he's got us through, is by using and exercising those gifts right back to him. We are all talented in a certain area, in a certain way. Martha uses it to serve him. And I do believe that God has given us a grace all to be able to serve him to some capacity. And I think what we need in our churches today is to be able to encourage our people, encourage our congregation, and remind them that you are gifted. Remind them that you have a purpose Remind him that God wants to use you. Whatever your gift may be, he can use it be, to be able to do things that you never would have imagined. And for Martha, one way she shows her, at her, her, her thankfulness to Jesus is by simply using her talents. And I think a good way to start in the church today is by reminding people you, how, you are talented. As a matter of fact, why don't you look at your neighbor, remind them, and tell them, you are talented. Look at your other neighbor and tell them, you're talented too. You're talented too. And that's what I love about Martha. Martha starts to serve because she's grateful. She's grateful for what Jesus just did in her brother's life. So she gets right down to business. She uses her talents. And I think, and what I love about Martha is that no one had to ask her to serve. Mary didn't have to ask her to serve. We don't read that Lazarus had to ask her to serve. What I love about Martha is that she saw a need and she started to fill it. And I think what's killing the churches today is that we got to beg people to simply serve. I think what's hindering the body of Christ today is trying to pursue people and to recruit people to simply serve and use their talents. I think that it's unfortunate that sometimes we have to um, beg people to simply volunteer their time. 
When we, in reality, if we can just look back in hindsight and look at all the things that God has done for us, how can we not give him our talents? How can we not use our gift and render them back to Jesus for everything that he's got us through, for the doors that he's opened, for the people he's put in our life, and even for the people he's taken away from our life? I think what's hindering the body of Christ is when we have to beg people to serve. If, 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 if we got to pick up gum after the service, then we're going to pick up gum after the service because of everything God has done for me. If I got to show up Sunday, early Sunday morning to pass out a bulletin, then you know what I'm going to do? The least thing that I can do is pass out a bulletin because God healed me from cancer, because God closed the door, because God opened the door, because God continually provides. You know why? Because God continues to wake me up every single day because there's air in my lungs, there's shoes on my feet, there's clothes on my back, there's food on the table, there's money in my pocket. How can I not step up to a need and be able to fill it for all the things God has done for me. And I think what we need in the church today is people to be more like Martha. Can you imagine what the church would look like today if we had a group of people, if we had a congregation of people who had a spirit of Martha and simply wanted to serve? Not because it benefits us, but it because maybe it benefits our neighbors. Because maybe it benefits the brothers and sisters that we're sitting next to right now. Or maybe because it simply just benefits the kingdom of God and it continues to be expansive. It continues to be inviting. And I think what we need today in our churches is people to see a need and be willing to rise up and fill the need without having to be begged. I figured you'd be quiet on this point. If you didn't like point one, you're not going to like point two. <laughs> but can you imagine that with me, church? where people don't feel like they only can sing because they're given a solo. But they're simply going to serve because they're grateful for what God has got them through. Not only does no one have to ask her, but I love that no one has to pay her. She does it as an act of service because of the things she's grateful for that God has done in her life. Read it with me. Verse 1 says this. In verse 12, it says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus was, had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. What does Martha do? Martha served. And Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary... Therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. She simply served him because she was grateful for him. That's what I love about Martha. Here's what I love about Mary. While Martha serves with her talents, Martha, Mary sacrifices her treasure. Martha serves with her talents, but Mar Mary, she sacrifices her treasure. Now, some historians believe that this ointment, this specific ointment, took about a, hunt, about a year's worth of her annual salary. That when she went into her bedroom and she got her expensive perfume uh, and she broke it, that some historians believe, some scholars are led to believe that this is an annual's worth of her salary. Some of y'all sitting on the edge of your seat like, I hope you're not about to say what I think you're about to say. I'm not going to say give, us annual, give the church annual. No, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, but that's, the, that's the, her heart. That's her attitude. That it didn't matter the expense. It didn't matter how far she had to go. She was willing to offer her best treasure to Jesus. And my question to you, what is your best treasure? How are we serving Christ? How are we coming alongside the church and leaders and being able to give God the best treasures that in reality he's given us? I remember growing up, um, my dad bought me a 
PlayStation 2. This was probably before your time, church. Um, and uh, he bought me a PlayStation 2. And I remember uh, playing the PlayStation. And my dad, he ended up coming downstairs. And he's like, I want to play. And, and, now, and for my dad to pick up a, a, a video game, it's like it's unheard of. You know, it's like this, this doesn't happen. This doesn't ever happen. And so this was a special occasion for me because here I am getting ready to bond with my father. Right. And so he's like, let me let me let me play. And I'm like, OK. And I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm I'm generally excited to hand him over the remote control. This is before wireless controls were out. So you only could be a couple of feet away from the TV. And so as I'm getting ready to over getting ready to hand him over the PlayStation controller, I also thought about maybe this could be a good business deal for me. And so I'm like, I want to spend time with my dad, but I also think that if I, if I kind of can, can manipulate it where I can benefit from this, I'm, I'm going to try. So I tried. And I said, okay, dad, I'll let you play, but you got to buy me another game. And he says, hold on, you, you, want, me to buy, you want me to pay to play? And I said, yeah, because this, this is my game. And I'm, I want you to play. I mean, you're going to play, but you got to buy me another game. As a matter of fact, this is the game that I want. It comes out next month. And he says, that doesn't make sense to me because you wouldn't be playing if I didn't buy it for you to begin with. So you want me to pay for something I already gave you. And that's sometimes our attitude towards God. Where he shouldn't have to rent out our talents. Or he shouldn't have to, he shouldn't have to rent or lease our treasure. Because we wouldn't have treasure to begin with if he didn't give it to begin to, for us to begin with. And so Jesus accepts this treasure that Mary pours on his feet. And what I love about Mary is that she does not stop there. She goes and she takes her hair out of, I don't know, a ponytail. And she lets her hair down. And I think that's what we also need in our church today. I think sometimes the churches can be so religious that all we got to do is you got to let your hair down. We got to let our hair loose and be willing to offer the best treasure we have to Jesus. You know how ridiculous she might have looked? You know how weird this situation might have been in front of Jesus and his disciples? But you know what? She did not care because she was so grateful for what God just did in her life a chapter before. And some of us, we ought to not care what we look like when we worship. Some of us ought to not care what we look like when we praise. We ought to not care what we look like when we come to church or what people are going to say to us because you believe in Jesus or because you read your Bible at work or because people see you praying out in the community at a restaurant. We ought to not care. I like Mary because she is radical and she does not allow herself to be distracted because she wants to render her best treasure back to Jesus. And when we look back in hindsight, how can we not do this? The same how can we not have the same attitude and render our best talents and our best treasure right back to Jesus because the reality is is we wouldn't have any treasure on our plate if it wasn't for his grace it was not him being Jehovah Jireh in season and out of season in our life Amen. and what I love about the story is we didn't we didn't read it but in verse 4 the Bible says that Judas he said well what are you doing you know what we could have did with that money and every time you get ready to offer your best treasure to God, you better expect a voice of opposition. There's always going to be someone or something that says you could do something else with your time. You could do something else with your talents. You could do something else with your treasure, especially when it comes to money. When you get ready to give God your your, your 10% or your tithe or your offering, there's going to be a voice of the objection that says, hold on, we need that money. Do you see inflation nowadays? Do you see these gas prices? Always expect a voice of opposition. Every single time you get ready to give God your absolute best, your absolute best treasure, there's always going to be some type of voice of opposition that says, yo, we got student loans. You get ready to give God your best treasure, there's going to be a voice that says, we could have went to the Dominican Republic. 
there's always going to be a voice of opposition. And you know what? It ought to be expected because the devil's a liar. And you want to continue to show God you're grateful by showing him your talents, by serving your talents like Martha and like Mary, sacrificing your treasure. Here's how we can give our time, our, 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 our gratitude right back to God. While Martha, while Martha serves with her talents, Mary sacrifices her treasure. But my favorite one of them all, and it will end with this, is Lazarus. Now, you have to remember, Lazarus, man, he just went through it. <laughs> to say the least. He was dead. <laughs> to put it simple. Jesus shows up on the scene. Puts him back to life. And you, where do you find Lazarus? He's at the table with Jesus. But I love how John says it. He's not just at the table, but he's reclining at the table. It's like, it's like he's like, he's not at the table, but he's like, he's at the table. He's reclining at the table. When I first read this, I kind of just imagined him like at a, on a lazy boy. And his legs are up. He's, he's like, he's hanging out with Jesus. You know why? Because he just went through it. So while Martha shares her talents, serves with her talents, and while Mar Mary, she sacrifices her treasure, notice what Lazarus does. It is my third and final point. Lazarus surrenders his time. He's just enjoying Jesus. And you know what? I would even go on record and say this is the best thing that you can do. It's just simply spending time with Jesus. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up as I conclude this sermon. And you'll notice that Lazarus, he's, just, he's at the table. And, and while he's at the table, he's just, he's just enjoying quality time with Jesus. There's this book called The Five Lung La Love Languages. And the author, Dr. Chapman, he, he suggests that there's five love languages. There's acts of service. There's gifts. There's affirmation. There's physical touch. And there's quality time. And, and as you read through this book, uh, he suggests, Chapman suggests that you ought to know your, your top two. Your top two love languages. Um, but when you have a relationship with Jesus, he speaks all of them. He wants you to serve him with your giftings that he gave you. He wants you to give him words of affirmation and tell him that he's beautiful and that he's great, that there's no one like him. He wants you to um, uh, ultimately, and the best thing to do is spend time with him. I love this that Lazarus is doing because it's the best thing that you can do. There's nothing like spending time with Jesus. What would your mornings look like if you started your mornings with Jesus? What would your evenings look like if you ended your nights with Jesus? And spending time with Jesus, the beautiful thing about having a relationship is that it looks different for every single one of us. But the key thing is that you're spending time with Jesus. I mean, you're going to spend time on social media anyway. So why not spend time with the Savior? I'm going to say that one more time so you can tweet it right. I mean, you're going to spend time on social media anyway. So why not spend time with the Savior? He's simply surrendering his time. I got the opportunity to go to um, Central America this year. And uh, my dad's from Guatemala. My mom's from El Salvador. And so uh, we took a little guy's trip. It was me, my brother-in-law, and my father. And we... We went down to El Salvador and we spent a few days there and we went down to Guatemala and we spent a few more days there. And um, while we were there, we were visiting my uncle and uh, it's my dad, eldest bro my dad's oldest brother. And uh, he, he's older, he's much older than my dad. He's nine, he was in his 90s, 90s and the week after we came back, he had passed away. And so it was nice to see him one last time. And it was nice that my dad, out of all people, got to see him. But while we were at his house in El Salvador, uh, we got to, I got to meet his wife for the first time, my, my uncle's wife. Um, I guess she's considered my aunt. That was a joke. And so, so, 
And so as, as they, sat, they sat next to each other, there was a moment where uh, they've been together for about um, almost 60 years or 50 years, something like that. They've been together for a long time. That's the point. And there was a moment there that uh, they held hands. And I was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. And, and, and then we had lunch with him. So we spent like all day with him. And, and then I started talking to him about his marriage. And he says, yeah, we've been together uh, over about 50 years. And, and I, love, I love being around her. And I said, even after 50 years? And he says, yeah, even after 50 years. You know, but it even gets better. Not only did they have a moment where they held hands, and he's telling me that he, he, he loves being around her, but they even dressed alike. And it doesn't stop there. I don't know if it's a Salvadorian thing or if it's like what happens when you just love somebody, but they held hands. He's confessing his love, and they're dressed alike, and they even kind of look alike. And I don't know if you've heard, but some psychologists would say and suggest that when you're with someone long enough, that your features start to almost assimilate with each other. Oh my God, that's crazy. And you know why that is? It's because they spend a lot of time together. And no wonder why Jesus wants you to spend time with him. Because therefore, you finally start to look like him. No wonder why you, God wants you to walk with you and talk with you because we finally reach a point in all these years that we walk with Jesus where we reflect the love of God. And so what do we do after Thanksgiving and how do we give thanks? We can do it in our talents. We can do it in our treasures. But the best thing to do is simply to surrender your time. Because when we give time to God, that's where we change. And that's where he takes us from glory to glory. Go on and stand to your feet as we sing this last song.